Worldnet presents Dialogue, an international televised exchange of ideas. Now, from our studios in Washington, D.C., here is your moderator, broadcast journalist, Jack Reynolds. Good afternoon and welcome to Worldnet's Dialogue. Today, for audiences in Europe and participants in Geneva and Stuttgart, we present a special program on the computational science revolution. I'd like to extend a special welcome to participants at Geneva's Telcom 87, the world's largest and most important telecommunications exposition. Joining us in our Washington studio today are John Stevenson, Corporate Relations Officer with the University of Illinois Foundation, and Larry Smarr, Professor of Physics and Astronomy and Director of the National Center for Supercomputer Applications at the University of Illinois. Gentlemen, welcome to WorldNet's Dialogue. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's no exaggeration to say that Dr. Larry Smarr is a pioneer in the United States. Yes. Uh, one thing I think is very important is illustrated in the first slide. When we talk about the supercomputer, we're talking about uh, a, the world's fastest computer at any given time. In the slide, the supercomputer is the red box in the background. But you see here a typical scientist using that supercomputer by working on a personal computer at his desk. Now, in this case, the personal computer is sitting in the machine room with the supercomputer, but what we're seeing is all over the United States, individual scientists working with their personal computers hooked over networks to distant supercomputers. In this case, the personal computer is an Apple Macintosh. The supercomputer from, built by Cray Research behind it is a thousand times more powerful than that personal computer. The next slide shows that even though we have enormously powerful machines now in 87 at the first red bar, the growth and the speed of the supercomputers over the next five years will provide us with machines that are uh, up to 20 times faster than today's machines. When you see the results of the uh, calculations that can be done with today's supercomputer, just imagine what we'll be able to do during the next five years. This growth in power has become possible because of what we call parallel computers, many computers inside the same box. The next slide is something I'm very proud of. This is a map of the United States only a year and a half after the supercomputing program was initiated by Congress and the National Science Foundation. Each of those circles is an American university in which scientists and researchers now have access to this kind of supercomputing power. Our center at the University of Illinois is one of five national centers sponsored by the National Science Foundation. Each of the other centers could show you a similar map. The size of those circles gives you an idea of the amount of supercomputing power that's being delivered to each of those universities, some in excess of over 1,000 hours per year. The next slide shows the beginning of what is going to be a very important component of the United States national infrastructure. This is the National Science Foundation's NSF net a network electronically hooking together the most important research universities in the country with the five supercomputer centers you can see in the solid black line connecting from California to the East Coast. An important part of this, I believe, is that Illinois has traditionally been the uh, railhead, whether it in this country for the infrastructure, whether we go back to the railroads or today in the airline industry or telecommunication industry, I think you'll see with all the fiber optic being laid in the United States that once again Chicago and the state of Illinois will be central to this involving national network. The national architecture that's being put into place is one of literally thousands of personal computers, each themselves very powerful, capable of doing the sorts of visualization we'll see in the next few minutes at the desktop of each person. They can be customized to that person's everyday working needs. They can have their word processing, uh, spreadsheets, and with a flick of the button, a supercomputer, a thousand times more powerful, hooking in to that personal computer as a coprocessor. That national architecture has not existed in this country before. It's something that I think is a very powerful, positive message for the future. Thank you, Dr. Smart. 
And now we'll turn to our overseas guests for an initial round of questions. I'd like to remind our participants to please identify themselves and their organizations. Let's begin with Geneva. Go ahead, Geneva. Dr. Molina from in Geneva. My question is to Professor Smar. Professor Smar, you started your presentation showing a supercomputer together with a microcomputer. Today, personal computers have the power mainframes had some 20 years ago. I would like to know what time span you foresee to have personal computers with the power of today's mainframes or even supercomputers. Yes. The, the question is, uh, as time goes on, uh, for many decades now, uh, computers have gotten more and more powerful. Uh, today's personal computers are as powerful as the supercomputer of 20 years ago. And the question is, when do I see the personal computers of the future becoming as powerful as today's supercomputer? Uh, and I would say we would see that um, roughly in the next 10 years. Um, the interesting point, though, is that by the time that my uh, computer on my desktop becomes as powerful as a Cray supercomputer of 1987, the supercomputer of that era will still be a thousand times more powerful than that personal computer. That is, this hierarchy of computers will stay in place. And in fact, there are a number of levels uh, it's very important to realize it's not just the personal computer hooked to the supercomputer. There are intermediate levels of machines. For instance, the new mini supercomputers, such as Alliant Computer uh, uh, Corporation has generated, in which the machine might be, say, about one-tenth as powerful as a supercomputer. Then there are machines maybe one-tenth as powerful as that, uh, which, by the way, are coming out as new workstations, scientific workstations, such as the Sun 4. Uh, then a factor of 10 below that maybe is the personal computer. I believe that hierarchical uh, nature of the computers is very important because a scientist today is going to use many computers out through the country hooked together by this network at one time on one problem. That's the new world of distributed computing as opposed to the old days in which we have a dumb terminal hooked to a mainframe. Thank you, Geneva. Now we'll go to Stuttgart. Please go ahead, Stuttgart. Karl Reinsch, University of Stuttgart Computer Center. Hello, Professor Smar. What are you doing in Washington? We expect you in Stuttgart. I will be Karl there. Karl Winkler will be here too. Yes, I, I would very much My like to be there. My question is, uh, and the Cray 2 is available. My question is, what, uh, what are your plans in migration of your computer centers and National Science Foundation computer centers? The plans for the future? The uh, right now, the National Science Foundation uh, is wrestling with the problem of how to uh, guarantee that the National Supercomputer Centers stay at the state of the art for the foreseeable future. That is requiring a very novel relationship to be developed between the national centers, the computer manufacturers, and the federal government. Uh, that new alliance is something we haven't seen before. And uh, it's something I'm very active in myself. I think that that will happen. And I think uh, the Congress will vote the necessary funds to make sure that this country's facilities stay at the state of the art. You just mentioned, and problems also that, that are like the weather problem that you mentioned, that require faster uh, processing. Is there any problem? either too large to be handled by today's supercomputers or requiring a processing speed not yet achieved that is waiting for a more computer power to, to be solved. Well, absolutely. And I think uh, the important point to realize is that we are just beginning to solve the problems of the complexity as we see in nature. John, I think we see uh, with the people coming to visit us from industry uh, just almost an insatiable need for faster machines to solve their problems, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely, Larry. The, 
the impact on, on uh, the corporate problems has been an interesting one to, to see evolve. When we first start talking to most companies, we find out that it's really a learning process for them to evaluate the type of applications that they want to use with this type of power and the visualization tools that exist in, in Larry's Center. Uh, over a period of time and experience, as that, uh, as that grows, why the depth of those applications gets greater and greater. It's not, not uncommon for companies to come to us and, and struggle with how do we even use, uh, use a supercomputer, but in a matter of, of just a few months, uh, they have many applications that are exploring various problems that they never dreamed of before. Uh, now they have the tool. Now they can go into that depth, and uh, that's been, of course, very rewarding for them, and, of course, it's uh, very important for their particular research. Stuttgart, we're going to go back to you for one question. Go ahead, please. University of Stuttgart again. Uh, we feel that the industry is very conservative uh, in using this new dimension of scientific research. Is uh, this the same in your country? I, I might comment on that. Um, I think the again what we're what we're seeing with uh, with companies, and we've been working now a little over a year and a half, with really going out and marketing uh, this joint research, if you will, the the use of the supercomputer and visualization. Uh, that companies, uh, you might say, are conservative, but I, I view it a different way. I think that they're learning how to use uh, the tool. Computational science as as a whole is a very new way to do research. And what we see evolve at the highest levels of every corporation we're talking about, every single one of them, is that it impacts the long-range business plan of the company, it impacts the way they do research, uh, it, it impacts the whole mechanical process that goes in within a, uh, on within a company on how they get a new product to the, uh, to the marketplace. So I think it, it may be conservative from one dimension, but I, I see it really as a, as a learning experience and one that as companies uh, do learn, they're just absolutely very, very interested and very excited in, in pursuing it. Pure composition in art and sound on the other hand. And this composition was recently shown at an international uh, conference on computer music held at the University of Illinois this summer. And I think uh, we should just sit back and enjoy it. it um, pure aesthetics from, from supercomputers. Absolutely wonderful. In the time remaining, let's return to Geneva for another question. Go ahead, please, Geneva. Yes, I think it's absolutely uh, essential to make your computing program a instrument of scientific precision. That requires, as you say, testing it constantly against any known analytic or, or mathematical solution, and whenever possible, 
testing it against laboratory experiment. That's an ongoing process, just as we have learned over the centuries to do in experimental work or theoretical work. And that part must be there if computational science is to join experimental and theoretical science as a third force in science, which we believe will happen in the coming decades. As we conclude, as we conclude today's program, I'd like to thank Dr. Smarr and Mr. Stevenson for joining us. Credit for this program should be given to WorldNet, the television and film service of the United States Information Agency. In Washington, I'm Jack Reynolds for WorldNet's Dialogue.